All right, are you ready to get started? I am. Thank you so much. Wait, how long do you think this is going to take? Just so I wrap my head around it. Um, 30 or 40 minutes. 30, 40 okay, minutes, yeah. however long yeah. you prefer. Yeah. So, uh, so let's start off. Can you uh, tell me your name and kind of give us some background about where you're from and how you got to Vanderbilt and maybe give us a little background about your time at Vanderbilt. <laughs> You say we have 30 or 40 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Trisha Rose Burt. Um, I'm a graduate, I went to Vanderbilt, I graduated in 1982. I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. What was the other thing I was supposed to tell you about? Oh, and just give some background about your time as a student. Okay, at so I went to Vanderbilt because mm -hmm. my older brother went to Vanderbilt. Ah. And so I, uh, well, I don't know how much detail you want. My parents were getting divorced at the time, so I just wanted to get out of my house. Mm -hmm. My brother went to Vanderbilt. I liked my brother. He liked Vanderbilt, so I thought, I like Vanderbilt. Um, and so I applied early decision in the 12th grade. At that time, you didn't have to commit. You could just mm -hmm. do early decision. And so I did. So I knew I was going to Vanderbilt in October of my senior year um, and was just set, ready to go. And my, my the expectation was, and I, looking back, I knew this, but the expectation was that I was going to have just the female version of my brother's experience at Vanderbilt. So it was fairly prescribed for me when I went. Mm -hmm. And, um, which all seemed like a good idea at the time. So, um, so I can remember my brother sitting me down and telling me which classes I was supposed to take. And so no one ever asked me, so what do you want to do at, in college? <laughs> or why do you want to go to Vanderbilt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I just very, I was just a really lucky thing I ended up at Vanderbilt in many ways because there was no real decision making around college other than, oh, he likes it, I'll go there. Mm -hmm. So you speak about the prescribed path and the prescribed Vanderbilt experience outside of maybe classes you were supposed to take. What else did that entail maybe socially for you? Oh, absolutely. I was supposed to be in a sorority without mm -hmm. question. I was supposed to be in a very particular sorority too. And... Um, and so, you know, so that was sort of the expectation that was set right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And um, and luckily for me, I got in that particular sorority, which turned out to be a wonderful thing. Although, I, as I've told you people before, while I loved the sorority, there was this group on campus at the time called the Original Cast, which sang Broadway musicals, and I really wanted to be in that. <laughs> <laughs> but that did not seem to be an option because I was just supposed to come to Vanderbilt and and I was supposed to be in a sorority. I was supposed to be very social, and part of it was all very, you know, social. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think my junior year I started studying. I share that sentiment. Yeah. Um, so, so when you speak of your time in Greek life, and um, you know, coming to Vanderbilt, and maybe those first two years, do you think that experience was stereotypical of what a Vanderbilt woman was supposed to be, or do you think it was? for a very particular type of woman, do you think? First of all, I'm just so tickled that you're using the word woman mm -hmm. because I don't think I even considered myself a woman then. I mean, I was still very much mm -hmm. a young lady. Do you know what I mean? With mm -hmm. all that yeah. went with that language, I was a young lady. And so as a young lady um, yeah, and a young Southern woman coming to you know Vanderbilt, there was just, you know, I was, I, there was never a lot of emphasis on on me pursuing, I mean, it was a lot of mixed messages, right? So I was supposed to excel, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis placed on intellect or the value of intellect or the value of the education. I was just supposed to go to Vanderbilt, do well at Vanderbilt, but there wasn't there wasn't a big ambitious goal from there. You know, I mean, I think but then at the same time, um, there was a lot of expectations to succeed, but there, but it was very, very blurry and very murky. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? When mm -hmm. my mother went to college, she was the K.A. Rose. Yay! I mean, like that, like, you know, she was a UT cheerleader and she was the K.A. Rose. And that was real success in her generation. And for me, it was like kind of what did the success sort of, I didn't know what the success meant, was going to look like or mm -hmm. what it went, what it meant. All right. So do you think that... Is this helpful at all? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, do you think? Uh, only new. <laughs> <laughs> so you speak a little bit. Uh, you've spoke to towards the change experience between your mother and your your own experience uh -huh. in college. Do you see just reflecting back on your experience and maybe what you've seen um, from college age women now? Do you think that's changing, or do you still think that pressure to perform socially still exists? You know, that's a really interesting question because I don't have children, so I can look at my friend's children mm -hmm. and, um, and like one of my best friend's daughters uh, went to another Southern University and her roommate was um, from the country of India. Her little sister in her sorority was from Nigeria. Her date to the debutante ball was Korean. Right, this would have never happened. Like, as my best friend said, we thought when we were being diverse, we knew a Kayo. I mean, you know, that mm -hmm. was, you know, we just knew someone outside of our own sorority, you know. And so I think, and, and um, on some level, yeah, I mean, the world is just so much bigger for my friend's daughters. They're, having said that, there's still kind of this layer of expectation. You know, there's still, there's, there can be, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's social tradition. I don't know whether it's family tradition. I don't know. It's still a little bit like, oh, you can tell there's just a little bit of a bump that things are like, yay, they're different, but also kind of a, ooh, they're different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's it's, it's kind of trying to wrap people's heads around the change or the difference or the wider world. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think zooming out a little bit and maybe speaking towards your four years at Vanderbilt mm. as a collective, did you see uh, a wide change in diversity from when you began and then when you graduated no. in 82? Do you no. think it was stagnant? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, to, you know, I my world was so small at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. It was very small um, because I didn't know that I had the choice to have a bigger world. And I think for me as a woman, you know, my, uh, I've spent a lot of time discovering I had choices and I never knew I had. So, that, so when I was in college, I actually did not realize I had choices. Like, oh, oh, and, you know, I didn't know that. And I've only kind of realized I had choices post Vanderbilt experience. And I think the women that I, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I was just last week with a bunch of women from Vanderbilt that were part of my sorority celebrating another one of our sorority sisters' successes and opening up a wonderful independent bookstore. So, right. Um, and I think, you know, I sort of look at all of us and the decisions we're making now are so much, many of us are making are, are just way more, and one's hopes, way more informed. We just didn't know from 1978 to 1982 that we really had any choices. Mm -hmm. We just didn't, you know, we didn't know. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Um, so, in, <laughs> running back a little bit, so you talked about how, you know, your courses were almost pre-selected for oh, yeah. you and you had this path. What did you end up majoring in at Vanderbilt and did that change at all while you were here? Um, so I, I actually, I actually have, I have a whole one woman show on this experience <laughs> <laughs> about, about looking back on what that experience is like. So when, you know, my, um, I came to Vanderbilt, I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Uh, in my household, everyone was in business. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how, that's the kind of conversation you had with my father. He was in business. So you talk, I mean, if you didn't really talk about business and you really didn't talk to my dad. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I went, I did, um, I worked my up from a from a withdraw withdrew failing grade to withdraw passing grade in economics, which I thought was a big success. <laughs> uh, I just couldn't get the whole guns and butter thing, you know. I just mm -hmm. it just it was, mm. and um, I didn't I didn't know what I should do. My boyfriend at the time was majoring in communications, and so I majored in communications. That's how I made that decision, and it was an interdisciplinary dis um, one at the time. I mean, now aren't we in the building all about communication? <laughs> so it's just, just fascinating. But it was just, it was an interdisciplinary uh, major and it was 48 hours and it was really vague. And I, it didn't make me feel like I was committing to anything really. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I'll do that. There's lots of wiggle room there. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, and so that's why I majored in computer. I mean, really, I am not a good example of like, you know, like I'm not the poster girl for Vanderbilt um, mm. and, and those kinds of, and those kinds mm -hmm. of ways. So. so do you think you took what you learned from your 48 hours in communications and were able to apply that outside of Vanderbilt? Or how do you see that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, am, I have to say, my Vanderbilt experience was a fantastic experience for all, for reasons that turned out to be just good dumb luck. I mean, I met mm -hmm. wonderful people um, and had a good, safe experience. Did I take advantage of everything Vanderbilt had to offer? No, <laughs> um, but I built on what I learned here. So I majored in communications, um, and I and I ended up going into public relations, and then I ended up going into training, and it, everything was around communications. Everything's around words and writing and speaking and all that kind of stuff. And um, and then now what I do is I'm actually uh, a writer and a performer and a storyteller, first person narrative. And it, it, of course, it roots itself back into what I majored in a million years ago, but didn't mm -hmm. know. You know what I mean? I yeah, didn't yeah. know the chronology. It was yeah. It. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was not a linear path. It was mm -hmm. sort of like let's go this way. You know. Yeah. So. Um, Going back, uh, what was your experience as a woman in your classes at Vanderbilt? Were you treated differently than your than the male students in your cohort? And did you feel comfortable speaking up in a co-ed classroom? So, um, I've never been one to not speak up. You know, I've, mm, you know, I think I tried, I think I always knew I wasn't doing it right as a woman at Vanderbilt. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, at the, I mean, this seems so crazy to say now, but, and maybe I'm just not remembering it correctly, but it felt, um, It felt, I just, oh, let me just say, let me speak it from my experience. I always felt with the group of women that I ran with that I wanted to be a, a little bit uh, more of a risk taker. I don't even know what that means. Um, Everyone was very safe in my world. Not everyone was having this experience at Vanderbilt. And so, you know, I just kind of felt like, you know, like there was some a constraint on, and I don't think I really understood that. I don't think I understood a lot of the times that, that boys liked quieter girls, which is probably why I never really dated that much. You know what I mean? I didn't... Yeah. Um, you know, I, ju I didn't, I, um, but I don't know that I was aware of like a, a larger thing at play. Do you know what I mean? I think I was mm -hmm. just sort of in my own experience of just never feeling like I fit in. Um, but I don't know that I, w that I was conscious of being treated differently. I think the person who was putting the constraints on me was me. Mm -hmm. of what what my behavior was supposed to be as a Southern lady, that mm -hmm. I was supposed to be appropriate and that I was supposed to not draw attention to myself and that I was not supposed to, you know, that I was supposed to defer to men. And um, and I was always rubbing up against that, but I, but I didn't have any role models that were saying, hey, come with me, we're going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so do you think that self-monitoring of maybe your behavior and um, That's a very good word, self-monitoring. Yeah. yeah, so do you think that that extends beyond the classroom? That's what I'm getting. So it's not only in the classroom that you might have felt this way, but maybe in campus involvement or in Greek life, do you feel like almost that um, need to defer to male peers existed just not outside of you know the academic life of Vanderbilt, but the social life as well? You know, I just feel like I didn't get the fact that I, like I was, like we were never, in, let me just keep it for my story. I was never allowed to be a troublemaker mm -hmm. for, even if it was troublemaker for good. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you just kept your place. And so I'm not, so even if there was an opportunity, I'm not sure I would have taken it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wasn't looking for those sorts of things. I wouldn't have. Now, there were other people I ran with who were involved with. Um, what was the name of that political group? Oh, oh. I don't know, it was student government. I can't remember. See, see, mm-hmm. look, I can tell you all the stories, but I can't tell you what was student government. Um, you know, it would have never crossed my mind to really? be, never crossed my mind to get involved in something that had to do with social change or government or social impact or, no, it would have never crossed my mind. Never do you think that's changed since you've left me? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. I mean, I've changed and what I see when I come to Vanderbilt has changed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thankfully. Whew. You know, but, yeah. but for, you know, however many years ago, what is this? We just had our 35th anniversary. Mm-hmm. It just it just wouldn't, it crossed some of my classmates, but it never crossed mine just because of how I was raised and, you know, what the expe- expectation was in our household, which was just, you know, mm-hmm. be smart, but just kind of keep it to yourself. To yourself, yeah. Yeah. So, I guess... Is now the time to tell you that I had a Vanderbilt professor hit on me? <laughs> like, in a really... <laughs> I mean, no, please speak more to that. <laughs> it's like, Honestly, it's, yeah. it's sort of the vibe going around now <laughs> these days. It's trying to be current. Um, <laughs> no, but do you think, um, even speaking to that, do you think there was pressure specifically from your professors to act a certain way in class or defer to male colleagues? Do you think that existed or... Did you think maybe that attitude was changing during no, the No, yeah, I Vanderbilt? really never got the sense mm-hmm. that um, from any of my professors that I was a woman and shouldn't speak out. I never did. And mm-hmm. the one, I just didn't. And um, and this is when I actually started going to class my junior and senior year and actually <laughs> excelling. Um, but um, I never got that sense from the professors. I did have one experience with a professor who who I just was so naive, I had no idea that, you know, I'd gone for help on a paper and he was like, oh, but do you want to come away with me this weekend? And I'm like, no, actually I have a date. I mean, it was like, and it was because he was in charge of the soccer team or something. Mm-hmm. And I was, it just it just completely went over my head because I was like, I can't, that can't possibly be true. Or, I mean, it didn't even occur to me what was happening. And then there was sort of more um, sort of, uh, um, obvious gestures and I was like oh wait like Mm -hmm. this is like wildly inappropriate and I feel incredibly uncomfortable and it took me 20 years to tell anybody that story yeah I was just about to ask I did you share this with your sorority sisters and friends oh god no even no. to this day, do things like that come up amongst your Vanderbilt friends about their No, time? I mean, I think I'm the one who said, hey, remember that professor? Now I say it out loud. <laughs> but at the time, oh, no. I, I, no, I would have never. Because mm-hmm. I just was like, it was just so, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And was it was just, just not. Uh, I just couldn't understand it. Like, I just mm-hmm. couldn't understand it. And fortunately for me, I have this personality that was kind of like, what are you doing? I mean, you know, so, mm-hmm. which was lucky. I, I, I have an extroverted personality. I didn't, I wasn't feeling intimidated. Mm-hmm. I was just feeling bewildered and kind of like, what the hell is that, you know? Yeah. I'm sorry, I cussed on the kit tape. What the heck? It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Changing gears a little bit, uh, were you involved in maybe the women's movement uh, on campus? And uh, to your recollection, was there an active feminist group on campus? I have absolutely no recollection of it. There could have been. Mm -hmm. And I know clearly I was not part of it. Um, And and which makes me sad. Like, Mm -hmm. I want to go back and go, can I redo that? Because there's just, I'd really like to redo this, you know. Yeah, so, and I know we talked about it earlier off camera, but the OMP, the opening of the Women's Center, do you think it affected the Vanderbilt campus climate at all? Um, And uh, maybe what did the Women's Center provide for Vanderbilt students like you or also unlike you, do you think? uh... You know what? Um, I think I want to be really thoughtful about this. I think when I was at Vanderbilt, there were a lot of um, questions I had around um, sex. 
<laughs> let me see. Let me see if I can get professors hitting on me in on this thing and <laughs> sex. But, you know, it was, um, there was a very clear, uh, so this addresses a women's center. Like, I didn't go to the women's center. It may have changed it for a lot of other people. My experience, such blinders, I need to go on this track. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I would have been the perfect candidate for a women's center. Um, and because I had so many questions, because I was really fighting against what not knowing I was fighting against it, but really okay. fighting against this prescribed things, wanting to be like, if I, you know, if I wanted to have sex, there was a camp of, you know, good girls just didn't have sex at all. And, and if you did have sex, then, then, ugh, you know, and, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? There was no sort of gray area. There was no sort of, um, you know, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine in Los Angeles. She's like, well, you know, when we were in college and we were all just experimenting, you know, and I was like, no, no, I want to go to your college. No, you know, but um, but so it just what an important role that would have been. I don't know if that's a woman's center role, but to have this have to have a w advocate for women. To really sort of. Um, just as a guy, because we many of us had mothers that were not going to have a conversation with us about anything. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to talk to our sorority sisters about it or whomever because we're all supposed to be good. So you're sort of so for me, I was like just kind of by myself trying to figure out some things and sometimes making choices that were not good ones because I didn't have. Uh, I felt really alone. I felt really alone at Vanderbilt because um, I had all this stuff going on and not didn't feel like I had an advocate or an ear or wouldn't even know where to go or wouldn't certainly wouldn't want anybody to know if I had to talk mm -hmm. to somebody about something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I guess now that we've been reflecting on your time at Vanderbilt say, I need for a little a glass bit. of wine now. <laughs> like, so stuff is coming up. No, absolutely. But <laughs> yeah. if you had to pick out one or two fond memories that really, um, really sum up for you what it meant to be at Vanderbilt at the time and uh, some positive things about your experiences. What what might that memory be, or what might that moment be for you? I hear a lot of this was the moment I knew I was at home at Vanderbilt, or this was the moment I knew that I was a part of a larger community. Um. Okay. I had a moment in Reba Wilcox's writing class. It was a creative writing class. Was it Reba Wilcox? I think that was her name. I think she was the editor of the Vanderbilt Magazine. And she had a creative writing class. And I loved her class. I felt, oh my, I was about to tear up. <laughs> um, really at home in that class because um, I think it was the only place I could express myself. I am so sorry. Um, the only place I could express, my, I really felt I could express myself, and she mm -hmm. recognized that. And I wrote this, it's, it's interesting, I wrote this story about being in my um, cousin's wedding, and the entire wedding was purple. Like everything in that wedding was purple. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, it was like, the, it was the first time I ever written, which I now do now, um, first person narrative. It was the first person narrative story I'd ever been asked to tell and told and wrote. And to this day, my mother will say, you know, when you wrote that first, that purple wedding story, we just knew that was so funny. And I mean, so that was, uh, that was a real breakthrough for me. I mean, that was a real highlight for me because I think it may have been one of the few times when actually I showed up at Vanderbilt, <laughs> like the real Trisha showed up mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt as opposed to the Trisha that I was instructed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a nice moment. Um, I had any class where I was allowed to express myself um, was a really important moment for me, but I can remember that about uh, Reba Wilcox's class in particular. Mm -hmm. So, speaking as the Trisha you know now and the real Trisha, mm -hmm. if there was one or two things that you could go back and change about your time at Vanderbilt or 
I know we talked about taking advantage of certain things uh, as a student, but if there was one you know, thing you could go back and change about your experience, what would it be and why? Um. I, well, I, I would have just come as, um, can it be one? I'm having trouble with this question. I'm, uh, clearly, I'm having trouble just answering we can just the question. <laughs> no, no, you were doing, you were doing <laughs> wonderfully. But if there are a couple things or. No, I mean, I can... just think I would love to come to Vanderbilt as me mm -hmm. as opposed to who I was supposed to be. So I go like, but even then, I mean, I use this as the example of I would look at the people who were in the original cast and go, I wish I could do that. I just you know, and and for some re for I can tell you the reason. I just never I just I never felt allowed to go beyond that box I've been placed in. And so I would look at people who would be like be on the radio station and go, oh. you know, I would look I mean, I just yearned to do those things that were right there, you mm -hmm. know. Nobody was saying don't do it. It's just what I showed up with said no this this is the route and I um, so if I had to do it all over again uh, uh, possibly go to a school where I didn't have an older sibling go first because it truly was you know mm -hmm. you're gonna follow in the path um, and I think that probably happens to a lot of kids here who come here behind a sibling it's like well, your brother was a this, and you need to be a that, you know. Um, maybe not. Maybe all the parents are enlightened and let their children do their thing, but or the kids are a bit. So I think that, you know, I think if I could change something, I, I think I would like to come with a mindset that was um, less rigid mm -hmm. and, and would have liked to have been in... Um, you know, maybe that's something that happens when you're a freshman. Um, I know there's, excuse me, so much more uh, um, involvement in a freshman experience now. You know, we were just all sort of, I mean, I know there was a net, but we were mm -hmm. all sort of corralled. You know what yeah. I mean? There wasn't really that attempt to say, well, who are you? And who are you? I mean, I don't know that it, you, it's... It's hard to put those mechanisms in place, you mm -hmm. know, but um, we just kind of all got lumped in, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Very long answer to your question. It probably not even really answered yet. But um, but ju I just, you know, it is, I think as a freshman, even if you have a strong sense of self, it's still hard. I mean, I showed up at Vanderbilt. I was a big dog at H.P. Plant High School in Tampa, Florida. You know, and then you show up at Vanderbilt. It's like everyone is a valedictorian and everyone is a homecoming queen. It looks like. It's not true. When you get mm -hmm. underneath the veneer, people mm -hmm. have real heartbreaks and struggles and are, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when you get here, you're looking around going, oh, oh, you know, shoot, you know, and there they all are and they all look good and they're all, you know, I mean, it just, and I showed up at Vanderbilt and my parents were in, you know, a horrific divorce and daddy just declared bankruptcy. But I'm trying to act like, Everything's great. I mean, you know, I'm going to be the yeah. sorority girl. I mean, it was just this little, and I, I can't possibly be the only student that went through that mm -hmm. then or now, you know, then yeah. or now. Wow. Thank you for that. And I know you spoke earlier about celebrating your th 35th I uh, God, and was... a, uh, reunion. <laughs> uh, the last time you were at Vanderbilt. Actually, I said 15. It's 15. 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can go with 10 as well. Let's go 10. 10. I'm going with 10. Last time you were on How's campus. How's the lighting? Is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, last time you were on campus, what was one of the biggest changes you noticed, whether that be in oh, okay. the campus building or the student body? So, or... I so I actually came to uh, do storytelling workshops for uh, some sophomores, and I'd actually dealt with graduate students as well, but these are undergraduate students, and I was in a building that has a name. Let's call it Alumni Hall, possibly Alumni Hall. You know, and, and you're in the, and you're in like, here's the Asian restaurant. I'm like, what? I mean, like, I mean, it just, and like... Not everybody's white. It's so fantastic. I mean, it's so mm -hmm. fantastic. 
It's just amazing. You know, I mean, when I was here, everybody dressed in Papagallo and everybody had, you know, and we just, there was this uniform, this universal uniform that most everybody, except the people in McGill, people in McGill were leading this whole other life and they mm. spoke different languages. And I was like, what happens in there? I mean, you know, it was like, I want to go in there, but I'd go be good, you know, because that's, I didn't know mm -hmm. yet I could go yeah. to McGill, you know. Um, and so that was what it was like. It was just, everybody was different. I'm like, hot darn. You do get that sense, though, that everybody needs to achieve. Like, you know, you can mm -hmm. just tell, like, we all, like, uh, it, I was really thrilled in the workshop I did on storytelling. I'm like, you know, you got to be a successful storyteller, you ha you got to show some vulnerability. You know, you got to say it. I'm not great at this, or this doesn't work, or whatever. And I'm like, are these kids going to be able to do Do they know they're allowed to be vulnerable here? And they were fantastic. I mean, like, hit it so far out of the park. And so it was just like, yay. You know, they made mm -hmm. really so smart and understood the concept of story right off the bat, but also um, very, very willing to be vulnerable in those moments. Um, I'm not sure I ever felt, like, safe enough to be vulnerable on camp. I just, you know, there was... I just never got that sense. And I came with some baggage. I mean, my parents get divorced and blah, blah, blah. But everybody's coming with something. Mm -hmm. Everybody's coming with something. I don't know what, what it may look like, but everybody's coming with something. So we're all posturing. You know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. everybody's posturing. It's grown-ups we're posturing wherever we go. But I think, you know, uh, but for me, it was just looking around going, there are so many different people here. This is fantastic. You know, this is so fantastic. So there you go. That was my... Awesome. Well... Thank you. I've peeled through some of my most of my questions. Were there any stories that you wanted to share that we haven't really? <laughs> Other than the fact I had a professor hit on me well, and I was <laughs> concerned about no one we to talk about sex with. We didn't ask that question, and you brought it up. Mm. Oh, were you not going to ask that question? Were you not allowed to ask that question? Oh. No. No. This yeah, is, I mean, this it is, was we really... didn't think to ask it. So uh, yeah. no, <laughs> this is suggest. free reign. These are <laughs> like like any list of questions. This yeah. is all a suggestion. So yeah, this no, is your that story. was really, and I didn't even know I should tell this on on that. This is actually what happened. We were screening these. I'm really trying not to say give a sense of what class this was and who the instructor was because oh, that's yeah. not appropriate. Um, I did. 20 years later when I was living in Ireland and they had the Vanderbilt in Ireland program or whatever, uh, or no, not Vanderbilt, the, the alumni people and Cassian Kovolchek, who was one of my professors, came over and I told him 20 years later in tears at a pub in Ireland. <laughs> but I was like, I just like, you need to know this. And I knew, like, we'll talk about the worst thing to do to that poor man in the middle of a trip he was doing. Anyway, there you go. But um, but I was sitting in this class and it was Saturday and we're all looking at these special projects that we were doing. And I had a sundress on and he leaned over and bit me on the shoulder in the middle of this class. He was behind me. Everybody else was in front. And I was like, wait, what? I mean, it was just bizarre. But did not know I could go to someone and say, you got to get this guy out of here. Had I just, because at the time, you didn't do that in 1982. You just didn't do that. You know, it just wasn't, I didn't even know I had the option of doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I really didn't know I had the option of doing that. And then went in a workplace environment and, mm -hmm. you know, some of that behavior continued. And I still didn't know I had the option, but I was like going back off. But I still didn't realize I had the opportunity to go to the boss and say, you got to get rid of this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to get rid of this guy. Um, but again, fortunately, I was kind of one of those people who were like, excuse me, <laughs> like, sure, I'm, this is not making logical sense to me. Any other stories? I don't know, like what? Like, what are we thinking? But so you didn't really know about that much about the history of the women's movement. Ah! Your, no. Like the no. Or <laughs> about what did you say? The EEOC or... No! No, I mean, I was like, oh, well, okay, what? I mean, just, and that's the thing for for my individual struggle was, you know, I just didn't, I was just trying to put this square peg in a round hole of, you know, none of this is making sense to me, but aren't I supposed to be doing this? But none of this is making sense to me, but aren't I supposed to be doing this? And so it was just this constant disconnect for me. I mean, the first time I ever, anything made sense is when I went to art school at 33, you know, so, um, and I do feel like when I come back to Vanderbilt, I feel like I just want to get all these freshmen and all these women and go, let me tell you, something. you know, and it's, but the options here, they're just, they're so much bigger and, you know, people more informed, but I was, you know, 
I just, I mean, literally, I love my mother. She was the K.A. Rose, you know what I mean? And many of us came with those mothers, you know, who didn't, you know, they, there was, you just didn't ask questions. You never asked a question. You, and you never went up against authority. That was just not appropriate. You did not do that. You know, I mean, it was very clear that was not the thing to do. And um, I have since changed that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, it was all, for me, Vanderbilt was hard because I never felt like I had the option of being Trisha. I cannot believe I started crying thinking about Reba Wilcox. Coxon, Cox, uh, Coxon, Coxon, Reba Wilcoxon, um, and she was fantastic. I mean, like she was this fabulous woman and really powerful, whatever that meant. But I, she just had all this authority and integrity, and I was like, you know, I really kind of wanted to be her, you know, because she was just—I don't know—she had it all together. That was really wonderful. I can tell you, I have, I have what I have on in that classroom right now. I'm sitting in that class. Wow. Um, um, yeah, but other stories, I don't know. So was Reba one of your only? I don't know. You know, I really, like, my, you know, boys were very important. Dating was very important. Making sure, you know, that was, making sure that you were in a relationship with somebody was very important. And, um, and so, you know, I mean, I know I made bad decisions because I was supposed to be in a relationship with somebody. So I was in a relationship with somebody that wasn't particularly nice to me. You know what I mean? And um, so there, it, you know, if I'd had a better, s you know, it is that the opportunity to, it was so cookie cutter. You know, there just didn't seem to be a lot of, there were, but, but, um, but I didn't realize that I had choices because I really didn't coming out of, you know, where I, my family household. And, um, you know, they're nice people. They just, you know, it was just, there was a very prescribed way because that's how they did it and it made them feel safe. And so, of course, their children should do the same thing and they'd feel safe. And, I mean, you know, you just, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of any other major events that happened. Um, I don't think I have too many of them. Thinking, uh, thinking back to uh, your class with Reba Wilcoxon, were there many professors like her? Were many of the professors women, or I had it... Randall Fisher, who was great, and I had Cassie Kavolchek, and I had Reba Wilcoxon, and those are the three that made the biggest impression on me. Plus the guy that bit my shoulder. But um, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, and again, they were really good professors, and I loved what I was doing in their classes, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's where, but it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. I don't know, well, I don't know if that was me and what my expectations were at home and how Vanderbilt was presenting things. And, you know, um, I mean, I went, I guess I had a career counselor, and they're the ones that sent me to Boston University in the summer, which is why I went to, into public relations, because the people in Boston University told me to go into public relations. And of course, I did what everyone told me to do. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do that. I, wasn't, I was 30, I think, when I made my first real decision, so that was, that was good. Um, we just weren't, you know, it just was so prescribed. Have I said that about enough? Have I said that enough? Um, <laughs> I remember I... Uh, you know, I had, I had other friends who took art history classes, and for the life of me, I don't know why I didn't take more art history classes. I took one uh, ceramics class, which I loved, um, but it just still, you know, they were the things were there. Mm -hmm. Not they certainly didn't have a whole studio art center like they have now. I mean, I drive by now, like going, what? <laughs> Can we? Just, can I go back? Can mm. I do this again? Is that you allowed? Can. For how much? <laughs> Is there a the, barter arrangement we can have that's here? That's the sixty-three thousand dollars <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. You know. No kidding. That is one thing that's changed. Um, mm. I don't know. I don't know. But it, it's wildly encouraging to come back now and just see, mm -hmm. you know, young women being. Uh, 
and navigating areas that I would not have been able to navigate. It's very hopeful to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Is that a wrap? Thank you. It's a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>